Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to Stanford University and to the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology, or KIPAC as we like to call it for short. It's our great pleasure this evening to welcome so many of you here in person. It's great to see such a, a fantastic attendance. Um, and also a warm welcome to those of you who are joining us online as we invite you to discover our universe with us this evening. My name is Dan Wilkins. I'm the co-organizer and co-host of our public lecture series, along with Dr. Zinan Du, who is our outreach and engagement manager. And it is my absolute pleasure this evening to welcome Dr. Adi Ford to the stage. Dr. Ford is a Polat postdoctoral fellow here within KIPAC at Stanford University. And her research focuses on some of the highest energy aspects of our universe. In particular, she analyzes supermassive black holes, combining observations we can make of supermassive black holes using the X-rays that are emitted from around them, and combining those measurements with observations that we can make across the electromagnetic spectrum. She works to better understand how black holes grow in the center of galaxies and the important effect that we now know black holes have to have had on the growth of the galaxies that they live in. And currently she's spending most of her days searching for pairs of supermassive black holes that are in the process of colliding with each other and merging into bigger black holes. And to do that, she's using some really amazing tools that she's developed to make sure that we're squeezing every last drop of information out of the observations that, that we can take. Adi earned her PhD from the University of Michigan in 2020. And before that, she received her BA in physics and astronomy from Boston University in 2014. So we're really lucky to have Dr. Ford joining us this evening to tell us about supermassive black holes and about our research. Just a little bit of housekeeping though, before we get started. After the lecture, we'll be hosting a Q&A. So those of you in the room, you're welcome to ask any questions you want. And also those of you joining us on YouTube, please feel free to ask your questions. You can ask your questions in the YouTube chat, either throughout Adi's talk, or once the talk finishes and we start that Q&A session. And to help get started with some of those Q&A, We've got some of our KIPAC graduate students joining us online who'll be acting as chat moderators. Um, so I'm just going to give our chat moderators the opportunity to introduce themselves. So we have Anthony. Yes, hi everyone, I'm Anthony. Uh, I'm a third year graduate student uh, here in KIPAC. Uh, similar to Dr. Ford, I also use X-ray observatories, but instead I use them to look at large clusters of galaxies and how they evolve with each other over cosmic time scales. Really interested in being here with you all tonight. And we have Brian. who is currently traveling us to us through the um, ether of the internet. And we have Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody, I'm Dylan. Uh, I'm also a third year student in KIPAC, um, and my research is on the large scale structure of the universe. So I study the distribution of galaxies in the universe and how it's statistically connected to the underlying distribution of dark matter and also really excited to see all of you there in person and our YouTube audience. Okay, wonderful. So again, those of you on YouTube, feel free to ask any questions you've got in the YouTube chat and Anthony, Brian and Dylan will be able to take care of you. And we'll save some of those questions for Adi at the end of the talk. So without further ado, let me hand over to Dr. Adi Ford. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, my name is Adi Ford. Thank you for that introduction, Dan. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and talk a little bit about how observational astronomers attempt to catch supermassive black holes in the material. We use what we learn from these observations to learn more 
how super math holds time. So let's what a supermassive black hole is. A supermassive black hole is an object in space is so large that not can escape it. The gravitational force of these objects are so large that you've taken a and it into a tiny compact space. So because light these objects, we can see them absolutely invisible to us. So observational astronomers who study supermassive black holes, studying is the material that's moving around. Light that circles around the black holes are called accretion. They're full of very hot, hot, and warm gas that emits across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. The supermassive, the hotter the gas, and the higher the energy that's going to be emitted. So, X rays are going to be emitted from the innermost regions of that accretion disk because they are a very high energy. And as you move outwards, you'll have lower energy emission, physical emission. The temperatures of the gas at these innermost radii are extremely, extremely hot. For supermassive black holes, they can be over a million Kelvin or over 1.8 million degrees Fahrenheit. An actively accreting supermassive black hole, so a supermassive black hole that's accreting a lot of material, it's emitting light that we can detect with our telescopes, is called an active galactic nucleus or an AGN. So I may be using the term AGN throughout my talk, and all I'm saying is a supermassive black hole that's accreting a lot of stuff and we can detect its emission. So based on many observations of our night sky, we believe that virtually all massive galaxies harbor a central supermassive black hole. And this includes our very own Milky Way galaxy. So to put things into scale, the average accretion disk is really big for a supermassive black hole. It's about 10 light days across. So this is the length that it would take light to travel 10 days. And this is about 40 times larger the distance between the sun and Pluto. So these accretion disks are much larger than our solar systems. The radius at which light cannot escape the supermassive black hole is called the event horizon. And for Sagittarius A star, which is the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy, the event horizon is about three times 10 to the negative five light days. So this is about 30,000 times smaller than the average accretion disk of a supermassive black hole. So it's a really, really small area, um, which kind of defines the radius of a supermassive black hole. So in general, black holes come in many flavors across the mass range. Not every black hole is going to be a supermassive black hole. So I have a question for the audience. How many black holes do you know about? Or are there any names of black holes that you want to share? <laughs> Sagittarius A star, that's a good one. Anyone else? You can just speak up. Online too, please share any names that you know. That's a good one, yes. Okay, well, it's fine if you don't know a lot of black holes. The idea of this lecture is that hopefully by the time that you leave, you'll know of a lot more black holes um, that you can share at your next dinner party. <laughs> so the first flavor of black holes are stellar mass black holes. These are black holes that have the mass of 10 to 20 suns. Astronomers like to use a solar mass or a sun as a unit. It contextualizes the mass of objects in space to the mass of an object that we're really familiar with. And a sun is about 2 million billion billion kilograms. So one sun is very, very massive. 
We believe that stellar mass black holes are the result of the death of very massive stars. These massive stars blow up into supernovae and the remnant is a stellar mass black hole. The Milky Way contains around 100 billion stars and we believe that one in 1000 are massive enough that at the end of their life, they'll result in a stellar mass black hole. So what this means is that it's possible there's 100 million stellar mass black holes in our Milky Way galaxy and in other galaxies in our universe. Intermediate mass black holes are the most elusive um, black holes that we know of. These black holes are thought to have hundreds to thousands of solar masses. We don't have too many candidates for intermediate mass black holes. And so we still uh, don't really know the formation mechanisms of these, uh, super of these intermediate mass black holes, as well as other things. And then lastly, there are supermassive black holes. These are black holes that have masses over 1 million solar masses. These are my favorite type of black holes. And most of today's talk will be on supermassive black holes. Okay, so luckily for me, it was Black Hole Week a few weeks ago. This is a week that NASA hosts and they prepare a lot of great material to teach the public about black holes. Um, and one of those pieces of material was this video um, that's showing stellar mass black holes in binary systems. So for stellar mass black holes, the best way to find these is to search for them in binary systems where they have a companion star and they're accreting material from that companion star. The material is being heated up to very hot temperatures and it's emitting in X-rays. So we can find these systems using X-ray telescopes. This video is showing the best studied stellar mass black holes that we know of, and it's about 20 systems. The systems appear at the same physical scale. So what it's demonstrating is the, diver the diversity in the orbits of these systems as well as their companion stars. Supermassive black holes also show a range of diversity when it comes to their masses. So their masses can span anywhere from around a billion suns up to tens of billions of suns. So this slide is showing a supermassive black hole called, called Cygnus A, which you believe is about 1 billion suns. M87, which is a black hole I'll talk about in more detail soon, which has about 6.5 billion suns of mass. And then OJ287, which is one of my favorite supermassive black holes and has a mass of around 18 billion suns. The current record holder is TUN 618. This is a supermassive black hole that we believe has around 66 billion suns of mass. Sagittarius A star, which is the Milky Way's central supermassive black hole, and I'll be talking more about Sagittarius A star soon, is relatively puny with respect to the supermassive black holes that we know about. So it has only around 4 million suns. It's really on the lower end of the mass range of supermassive black holes. All right, so until 2019, most evidence for the existence of supermassive black holes was indirect. So for Sagittarius A star, which is once again, the supermassive black hole in the center of our Milky Way galaxy, its presence and its mass has been constrained by teams that tracked the innermost orbits of stars in the center of our galaxy. And that's what this video here is showing. All of these stars had orbits, which seem to be under the influence of the same central massive object. And the Galactic Center Group at UCLA has been studying the orbits of thousands of stars at the center of our Milky Way galaxy for over 20 years. SO2, which is the star with the yellow orbit, it's the innermost orbit, at its closest approach is only 17 light hours from the Galactic Center. So that's about four times the distance between the Sun and Neptune. It gets very, very close to the Galactic Center. So the very massive object who's influencing all of these orbits can be determined analytically once you know how these orbits are. And it was determined to be around 4 million solar masses, which is consistent with a supermassive black hole. 
Astrophysicist Dr. Andrea Ghez, who leads this group at UCLA, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2020 for her contributions to this field. All right, excitingly, um, the Event Horizon Telescope most recently has allowed for the first direct evidence of supermassive black holes and has done so by imaging a supermassive black hole for the first time. The Event Horizon Telescope is an array of radio telescopes that are scattered all over the Earth. It has a really superb resolution and it was able to resolve the event horizon or the shadow of the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy M87, which is what I'm showing on the slide. So that dark circle in the very middle is a radius, which is very close to the event horizon of this supermassive black hole the radius at which light cannot escape, and that's why it's dark. Many people thought it looked like a donut. Most recently, only a few weeks ago, the Event Horizon released its first image of Sagittarius A star, which is once again, the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. So this is very exciting for um, all of the humans on planet Earth. We had direct evidence that we have a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And once again, you can see that there's a darker circle in the middle of that image. That's a region very close to the event horizon of the supermassive black hole. So resolving a Sagittarius A star on this scale is similar to resolving a donut, which is sitting on the moon. So it's quite impressive what it was able to do. So you may be asking, why do we see a ring around the supermassive black hole? And this video nicely depicts exactly why. The gravity of the supermassive black hole bends the surrounding space-time, and thus it bends the path of light that's coming from behind the supermassive black hole. And that light is bent to be emitted all around the supermassive black hole, and it naturally forms this halo. So this halo would appear for any image of a supermassive black hole, regardless of the angle that you're viewing it, and it's all because of the space time that's being distorted by the presence of that supermassive black hole. So interestingly, the images of M87 and Sagittarius A star were similar in size. And this is interesting because M87 is actually 2000 times further away from us than Sagittarius A star. So you may be wondering why wasn't the image of M87 much, much smaller? The answer is because of how massive M87 is. In this video, what we're doing is taking the image of M87 and we're bringing it closer to us to see what it would look like if it had a much smaller distance from us than what it does. Um, and as you can see, as M87 is moving closer and closer to us, the image is appearing huge. And if M87 were actually at the distance uh, that Sagittarius A star is, it would look a thousand times bigger than what we see. And that's because that supermassive black hole is a thousand times bigger than Sagittarius A star. So M87 is so large that our entire solar system can comfortably fit within its event horizon. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing Pluto's orbit within M87's event horizon. You can see that it's comfortably inside of there. And if we zoom in, you can finally see Sagittarius A star where Mercury's orbit wouldn't even fit within its event horizon. So Sagittarius A star is very, very small with respect to M87, but also just in general, its radius of influence is actually pretty small, which is interesting because it's really, really massive at 4 million solar masses. And with respect to our galaxy, Sagittarius A star is absolutely negligible. So our Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. And our solar system sits about 27,000 light years from the center. Now Sagittarius A star sitting in the center, it has an event horizon radius of about 10 to the negative seven light years. So this is many, many orders of magnitude smaller than the extent of the Milky Way galaxy. What this means is that most material in our galaxy does not care, 
doesn't even know about the existence of our supermassive black hole. And this is the case for most galaxies in our universe. The material there does not care that there is a supermassive black hole. The radius of influence is so small with respect to the scale of the galaxy. However, observationally, supermassive black holes seem to have large scale impacts on their environments. So very strangely, stars that sit very far out from the influence of the supermassive black hole seem to know that the black hole is there. So what I'm showing on this plot is masses of many supermassive black holes plotted against the speed of the central stars in their galaxies. And as you get to more and more massive supermassive black holes, the speed of those central stars increases. So there's a trend there. Once again, these are stars that are really far out from the sphere of influence of these supermassive black holes. And yet it seems that their speed is somehow dictated or related to the mass of this central object that's sitting there. This relation is called the M sigma relation. It's very well known of, um, around supermassive black hole astronomers. M is for the mass of the supermassive black hole and the sigma stands for the speed of the stars. So what this indicates is there's some sort of connection perhaps between the growth and evolution of a supermassive black hole and the growth and evolution of its galaxy and the stars within it. Oops. <laughs> so, uh-oh, I got the rainbow spinner of death. <laughs> um, Okay, I think we're good. Technical difficulties. So the take home point from this slide is we think that black holes and galaxies grow together. So this implies that there might be times, this, I'm um, sorry, this video should be playing. Um, okay, regardless, what this implies is that there are times in the supermassive black hole's lifetime where it might be able to affect larger scales than its radius of influence. Um, and what this video is showing is just a couple examples of, of what that might look like. So there may be moments where the supermassive black hole can inject energy on much larger scales that extend to the size of the galaxy. So what this video would be showing are, huh? Oh, try again, okay. No, <laughs> that's fine. Um, it's just a cartoon video. What it would be showing is uh, the presence of certain jets coming out from the supermassive black hole or winds. And I'll be talking a little bit more about these in the next slide. Okay, so it's advanced. Um, so we see evidence of active supermassive black holes with galaxy scale emission. Um, we see cases where supermassive black holes are able to inject feedback into scales much larger than their normal um, radius of influence. So in both of these galaxies, there is a central supermassive black hole that is powering these powerful jets. These are relativistic um, beams of particles. They're traveling very close to the speed of light and they're extending much beyond the galaxy's extent. So in Sen A, um, the length of one of these jets is around 13,000 light years. And in Hercules A, the total extent of these jets is over a million light years. So in both of these cases, the central supermassive black hole is affecting a scale that's between 10 million to 1,000 million times its normal radius of influence. So it's really impressive. Not only that, we also see evidence of supermassive black holes injecting energy at scales that surround galaxy clusters. Now, galaxy clusters are groups of thousands of galaxies that are gravitationally bound and interacting with one another. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing the Perseus cluster. This is an X-ray observation of this cluster. And we see these large bubbles 
that are being blown out very far away from the cluster. It's believed that there's a central supermassive black hole sitting in one of these 1,000 plus galaxies, NGC 1275, that's blowing these bubbles. These bubbles are affecting all of the galaxies in this cluster. The galaxy cluster that I'm showing you on the right-hand side homes one of the largest central um, supermassive black holes that we know of. And this supermassive black hole is powering jets that we see in radio emission, which is shown in the red, that extend way beyond the galaxy cluster. So these are really kind of extreme examples of supermassive black holes that are able to affect scales much larger than a galaxy. However, many supermassive black holes don't have evidence of this large scale emission. Most of them do not have these fantastic jets that we can image. Um, however, there are other methods. Sorry, this video should be playing too. Um, and perhaps there's an issue with the internet. In any case, um, there's other methods of energy injection, such as winds, um, that can be launched from accretion disks. What this video would be showing you is a video of a wind that's being launched from an accretion disk and blowing through a galaxy. We cannot image winds as nicely as we can image jets, but we do see indirect evidence of winds on our data. So the particles in these winds that are being launched off of accretion disks can actually absorb some of the energy that's being emitted from that accretion disk. And so when we look at our supermassive black holes in X-ray observations, we sometimes see a dimming of light at certain energies. And this is evidence that there's something along the line of sight that's absorbing those photons. And we think that they're winds. And I apologize that the video didn't play. It was a pretty cool video. <laughs> Just believe me. Okay, um, however, most supermassive black holes don't have really any evidence of large scale emission. So most galaxies in the night sky look quite normal. And this is an example of what you might observe if you had an optical telescope and you pointed it at the sky. Most galaxies look pretty um, spirally. They don't have evidence of any sort of disturbances. They don't have obvious jets, for example. And so there's still a lot of unanswered questions within the astronomy community regarding when and how supermassive black holes might get into an active state where they can affect material at much larger scales. And whether or not all supermassive black holes are expected to undergo these more active stages. It is, however, thought, I'm glad that this video is working because this is a really cool one, um, that galaxy mergers might play an important role in introducing periods of activity, where large scale energy input from the supermassive black holes during mergers can regulate the growth of their galaxies. So what this simulation is showing you is two spiral galaxies, which are merging. Each one of them has their own supermassive black hole. And as they merge, there are periods where these supermassive black holes are kind of triggered. They um, are able to actively accrete and inject energy at really large scales. So both of these supermassive black holes uh, get winds, which you're seeing right now, and those winds are blowing gas out from the center of the galaxy. And at the very end, when the two supermassive black holes merge, you end up with a kind of diffuse galaxy. It's not as clumpy or condensed as your original spiral galaxies, and you have a much more massive supermassive black hole left in the center. So interestingly, the same team that made those galaxy merger simulations decided to look at some of the properties of their merged galaxies. And so what they did was look at the combined mass of a merged galaxy versus the speed of the stars in that merged galaxy as well. And they found a very similar relation to what we observationally find. So they found that the more massive the supermassive black holes in their simulations, the faster those central stars were moving in the galaxies. And this matched up really nicely 
with our observational data for that M sigma relation. And so what studies like this have showed is that it's possible that galaxy mergers not only allow supermassive black hole accretion to kind of be triggered and supermassive black holes to get really active, maybe form jets or winds, but it can also result in um, impacting the galaxy in a similar way to what we actually observe. And we think that most galaxies will actually merge in their lifetime. So what I'm showing you on this slide are some beautiful Hubble Space Telescope images of galaxy mergers. So these are real galaxies that the Hubble Space Telescope has observed. And the um, Hubble Space Telescope surveyed the entire sky, and they found that you have a 5% to 25% chance of observing a galaxy merger if you observed a random galaxy in the sky. So there's a pretty high probability that at any given galaxy in the sky will be undergoing some sort of merger. And theoretically, simulations have shown that most massive galaxies will merge at least once in their lifetime, and smaller galaxies will merge even more times in their lifetime. During these mergers, we can expect that these central supermassive black holes should ignite and become active and be emitting in wavelengths all the way from radio emission up to X-ray. Assuming that most galaxies have central supermassive black holes, and knowing that most will undergo some sort of merger, we expect to see many pairs of actively accreting supermassive black holes or many pairs of AGN. However, we only know of a handful of pairs of AGN. The number is drastically smaller than the number of galaxy mergers that we see in our universe. And at the end of the day, it's really not that easy to find them. So what I'm showing on this slide is an optical image of a galaxy. This was taken with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It's a ground-based observatory. Um, and from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey observation, it looks like a normal galaxy, nothing too special. If you get follow-up observations with the Hubble Space Telescope, this telescope is also imaging in the optical band, but it has a much better resolution you can see that the Hubble Space Telescope found some additional structure. So it looks like this is a possible galaxy merger. One of those nuclei is in that red box, and the second nuclei, which is just a pinpoint of light, is within the orange box. So higher resolution, you can find more interesting things. Now, if you got follow-up observations with an X-ray telescope, you could peer into the very center of each of those nuclei and try to see if there was X-ray emission consistent with two supermassive black holes. So as an X-ray astronomer, this is what a supermassive black hole looks like to me. I know I showed you a lot of really beautiful images of black holes, but this is a very exciting detection for me. We're detecting photons, individual photons. They're coming near the accretion disk of these supermassive black holes. X-rays are some of the best rays for finding supermassive black holes and for finding pairs of supermassive black holes. If you remember earlier in this talk, I spoke about how X-rays are coming from the innermost regions of that accretion disk. So we are able to kind of zone in on the smallest physical scale of emission that's coming from these supermassive black holes. X-rays are also a very high energy and they can more easily pierce through dust and gas than other um, photons like optical photons, which were at a lower energy. So we know that galaxy mergers are likely really dusty and gaseous environments. X-rays can more easily get through all of that dust and gas and reach our telescopes. So for most of my work, I use the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Um, this is an observatory that has the best resolution out of any X-ray telescopes. So it's really good at resolving closely separated pairs of supermassive black holes. 
Searching for pairs of AGN or actively accreting supermassive black holes is a multi-wavelength endeavor, endeavor. And this video is showing how a triple galaxy merger might look like depending on your telescope and on your wavelength. So in the infrared, this triple galaxy merger looks like a single blob. And that's really because of the resolution of the telescope that's imaging the system. If you get follow up with the Hubble Space Telescope, which has a better resolution and is in the optical band, you can see that it's actually resolved three interacting galaxies at that point. Now, if you get follow up in X-rays, so you're trying to track a mission that's associated with two supermassive black holes, you can see that there's only two points that are X-ray bright. So although we have a triple galaxy merger, we think that only two of these galaxies have active supermassive black holes. The ability to find pairs or triplets of merging supermassive black holes really depends on your resolution. You can only do as well as the resolution of your telescope allows you to. So unfortunately, the closest supermassive black hole pairs are really hard to find even in X-ray. So what I'm showing you here are two simulations of observations taken by the Chandra X-ray Observatory. So this is an X-ray observation. One of these simulations is a single supermassive black hole, and one of these simulations is a pair of merging supermassive black holes. And I want to ask the audience, as well as those online, can you take a guess which one of these simulations is the merging pair of supermassive black holes. Okay, I heard two, two. Well, everyone's very confident in two. How does, what is online? Oh, oh, the moderators should bring it up. Yeah, so could also ask the, the online audience. Okay, online audience, please also <laughs> take your guesses. Um, you have a 50% chance of being right. So you have a pretty good shot. So the actual answer is, is number one. So number one is, is the simulation of a pair of, of merging supermassive black holes. And the reason why you can't tell is because the separation is smaller than the resolution of the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And so this is one of the biggest reasons why we have yet to find a lot of the pairs of supermassive black holes that exist out there. We just don't have the necessary resolution. So at KAIPAC, we're working really hard to try to find more pairs of supermassive black holes, and we're using statistical tools to do so. So here I'm showing you now 10 simulations these are all observations as seen by the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Five of these are single supermassive black holes. Five of these are pairs of merging supermassive black holes. I won't quiz you again, but I'm bolding in the black boxes the pairs of the supermassive black holes. And so we've developed statistical tools and have been able to correctly identify each of these simulations as likely being a pair of supermassive black holes versus just one supermassive black hole. The idea is to eventually run this tool on many, many X-ray observations and try to find pairs that we might not have been able to easily see. Of course, at the end of the day, we always wanna take a step back and try to think about the bigger picture that we're trying to answer. And that is what kind of mergers influence the activity of supermassive black holes? What kind of environments will you maybe have an active supermassive black hole where a jet can form or winds can form and can then affect and regulate the growth of that galaxy? So this is results from a recent study and I'll take you step-by-step step through all of these figures. On the left-hand side, I'm showing optical data of triple galaxy mergers. So there are three galaxies in each of those optical images. It's a little bit low resolution, but you can kind of see three bright points of light in each of them. So these galaxies are all merging with one another. And we looked at the X-ray data that was available for these galaxy mergers. And in the boxes around the X-ray panels, I'm showing where each galaxy sits. 
So for one of these galaxies, we are able to find evidence in the X-ray data that there were three supermassive black holes. All the galaxies had an accreting supermassive black hole. However, in one of the triple galaxy measures, we only found evidence for one accreting supermassive black hole in the X-ray data. And our, across our sample of about 10 or so triple galaxy mergers, we found examples where there were no actively accreting supermassive black holes in the X-ray data, and um, examples where there were three, like I'm showing you here. And so on the final plot that I'm showing, what we looked at was how the number of supermassive black holes that we found depended on things like the levels of dust in the merger and the levels of gas in the merger. And so the one triple galaxy merger where we found three AGN, which is shown in the yellow diamond, had the highest levels of dust in that collective merger and the highest levels of gas. And all of the other triple galaxy mergers had lower levels of both. So what we concluded is that you're more likely to have an active supermassive black hole. You're more likely to have activity triggered onto a supermassive black hole if you're in a really dusty and gaseous environment. And that isn't that surprising because that's exactly the material that supermassive black holes like to eat. However, we want to do this on a much larger scale in the future where we have hundreds of pairs of supermassive black holes and we can start to confirm trends that we're seeing in the data. Okay, so I want to end this talk just briefly discussing how future observations will push our understanding of supermassive black holes. And so I must quickly bring up JWST because this is an infrared space observatory that just recently launched in December of 2021, and it's the largest space telescope ever built. It's going to do very cool things like look at some of the earliest galaxies in our universe. But something else it's going to do is look at Sagittarius A star. And it's going to try to observe the flickering of Sagittarius A star. So what I'm showing you in this video is an image of Sagittarius A star taken from the ground, a ground-based telescope. And you can see that it's flickering on the scale of hours. All supermassive black holes flicker. These flickers represent random fluctuations in the feeding process of supermassive black holes. And so with JWST's observations of Sagittarius A star, we can get a better understanding of how it eats, how it accretes material, and how it grows. Also, of course, being an X-ray astronomer, I need to talk quickly about future X-ray space observatories. So if we one day put an X-ray observatory into space, that has a better resolution than Chandra, which is the telescope that I use, we will be able to find many, many more supermassive black holes and many, many more pairs of supermassive black holes. What I'm showing to you on this slide, on the left-hand side, is a 4 million second stare that the Chandra X-ray telescope did at a random patch in the sky. It collected all of the photons that it could over those 4 million seconds, and that's what you're seeing in those pinpoints of light. On the right hand side, I'm showing what that same patch of sky might look like if we had another X-ray telescope in the sky that had a better resolution than Chandra and was a little bit more sensitive than Chandra. And we could find 10 times as many sources that Chandra is able to find. This will open the door for a better understanding how supermassive black holes grow and evolve. And we'll also be sensitive to finding more closely separated pairs of supermassive black holes that are merging. Okay, so I hope that um, over the past 40 minutes or so, I've convinced you that supermassive black holes are both massive and tiny. They appear to grow and evolve with their surroundings. And that we hope with new observations, we can push our understanding of how these systems grow and how they maybe affect their surroundings as they grow. I'm ending this lecture with one of my favorite videos. This is a video of what it might look like if you had a pair of supermassive black holes orbiting one another on the verge of merging, and you had the resolution to image their event horizon. Not only would you see light being gravitationally lensed from behind each supermassive black hole, 
But as they orbited one, one another in our line of sight, we would see that light being bent by the other supermassive black hole as well. And it creates this really cool signature. Perhaps in the future, we will have a telescope and a system to observe to get observations like this. Um, so thank you so much for listening to me speak, and I'll take any questions. Oh, wow, that was an amazing presentation. Thank you, Adi. I personally also learned a lot, and um, so I would encourage um, everyone here um, in person and also online to ask any questions that you may want to um, get an answer for. Great. Um, let me actually uh, uh, rephrase that for the online um, audience. So uh, what kind of materials do we typically find in the jets of these supermassive black holes? So these are uh, particles of material that are likely originating in the accretion disk. And as this jet forms and it creates kind of this funnel, that material is able to then get funneled along the jet. So it's a lot of um, dust and a lot of gas as well. On that topic, uh, the actual acceleration mechanism for the jets, is it like a gravitational assist? Is there some other mechanism? For actually launching the jets? For actually launching the jets. So um, the launching of the jets, I think, is still an active area of research, but um, because it's something that we haven't observed in real time. But what simulations have shown is that when these accretion disks are accreting at a very, very high rate, the magnetic fields that are in the accretion disks can actually get tangled. And um, eventually the tangling of those magnetic field lines can create this funnel that shoots outward. Um, and so it's those magnetic field lines that are accelerating the particles that are, are moving along it. Okay. Um... Can I have some information about how the timelines work? I mean, if, a, if you see two black holes merging is this a matter of a thousand years as we are observing uh, or a few seconds? Yeah. Tell me the order of magnitude. No, that's an excellent question. So um, the, a galaxy merger can take hundreds of millions of years. Um, and so the galaxy mergers that I showed you on these slides will not merge in our lifetime. It will be hundreds or tens at least of millions of years until they merge. Yeah, so it's a pretty lengthy process. Cosmologically, how, how do these things form? Supermassive black holes? Yes. Yeah, so that's also um, a really active area of research. Um, so there's kind of um, two main mechanisms which we think could be happening, either a top-down approach or a, a bottom-up approach. So the top-down approach is that you might have some really massive gas cloud, for example, or some really, really massive star that could have only existed very, very early on in our universe. And the collapse of all of that mass forms some sort of seed, a supermassive black hole that maybe has thousands of solar masses that can over time accrete, merge with other supermassive black holes and eventually become a supermassive black hole. The um, bottom up approach is uh, where you have a many um, kind of stellar mass black holes that are all merging together over time. And eventually you can try to reach some sort of supermassive black hole through a lot of accretion. Um, so observations with JWST, for example, will help better um, push our understanding of which one of these scenarios it could possibly be. It's also possible that there's a handful of scenarios that are happening. There's not just one route to getting a supermassive black hole. Um, okay, question is, can there be multiple black holes in a galaxy? Um, so, so for supermassive black holes, we think that most massive galaxies just have one. There are some caveats to that, because of course, when you have galaxy mergers, for example, there are instances where you kind of have an in-between two, one galaxy that might have two supermassive black holes. Um, but at the end of the day, everything heavy is gonna sink to the center. And so 
any second supermassive black hole is undergoing a merger, they should eventually coalesce. There are certain situations where you might be able to kick a supermassive black hole out of a galaxy merger. Um, and that's a really interesting uh, field entirely on its own. Um, for stellar mass black holes, we think that we have like millions of these things in each galaxy. Okay. Um, a question about the image of the Sagittarius A. Uh, it looks very clumped and non-uniform. Yeah. And you explained that it's the, the light behind the black hole is forming this disk that we see, and the light is from our galaxies. So shouldn't it be just a circle? Why is it having those clumps? So, and um, Dan can jump in if I don't fully answer this correctly. So from my understanding, at least of the Sagittarius A star image, those kind of like brighter points, there were like three brighter points. That might have just been an observational effect where there might have been lines of sight where you had more radio coverage, for example. And so it wasn't really even basically um, the illumination of that halo. However, um, for M87, there were also some brighter patches in that disk. Um, and they do believe that those are just areas where material is moving much faster in the accretion disk. So it's getting beamed, for example, and it appears brighter. Do you want to add anything to that? Okay. <laughs> and to that actually it ties really nicely back to one of the online questions we got uh, from Mauro Cubito um, asking, why do the images of Sagittarius A star and M87 look so similar while we know the supermassive black holes are so different? Yeah, so I think that that's a really great question. And I think it kind of just um, uh, showcases like how beautiful these supermassive black holes are like mathematically at a very small scale, they all look the same, right? They all have some sort of event horizon where light can't escape or it's dark. And then there's light being accreted around it. So when you get to those really small scales, you might expect that supermassive black holes will look the same. And this is not true for when you back out and you start looking at the accretion of those black holes or the jets, right? But at very small scales, supermassive black holes are very, very similar. Great. Um, and uh, next question from online audience uh, is from DP Singh asking, which one came first? Is it the parent galaxy or is it the supermassive black holes? And do they grow together? Yeah, so, so this is a question that will, will win you the Nobel Prize. So it, it links to the origin of supermassive black holes. The answer is we don't really know. Um, so for example, if you start with some really massive gas cloud or some really massive star that collapses, it's possible that the black hole that forms from that can then start accreting material around it and you can start growing a galaxy. Um, in the other scenario where you're kind of building up that mass of that supermassive black hole through collisions, you're likely already in an environment where there's a lot of gas and stars that have formed those, super, those, those stellar mass black holes. And so in that case, you probably already have some sort of galaxy that's then building its supermassive black hole. So we don't really know, um, but it's possible that all of those scenarios are happening. Yeah, and another um, great question from online is, um, by Tony Tillman asking, do black holes ever lose their mass? <laughs> um, so um, theoretically, it's possible. Um, this is perhaps linking to something called Hawking radiation. Um, I'm probably not the best one to go into detail of how that works, but um, I don't even know if I should try. Basically, <laughs> quantum mechanics predicts that at any random moment, a um, particle and its antiparticle can appear in space. Its net energy is zero because you have a particle and its antiparticle appearing together. In the situation that this pair appears very close to the event horizon of the supermassive black hole, it's possible that one of the particles will get sucked into the black hole and the other particle will be emitted from the black hole as Hawking radiation. The particle that has been sucked into the supermassive black hole has a net negative energy and it eats away at the mass of the black hole. It will take eons for Hawking radiation to take all the mass away out of the supermassive black hole. Um, so it's not anything um, that we're worried about currently. Well, uh, that's good, okay. Um, over there. 
mentioned using a lot of data from uh, Chandra, which I imagine must be a very popular source of data. Right? So I was wondering, uh, will like, an astronomer do it? Uh, like your observation request is not approved, like when you expect it to, or like when you're waiting on new data, basically. Oh, like what do we do in our spare time when we're waiting for data? Is that the question? <laughs> That's a good question, and I need to be smart with my answer. Um, no, so <laughs> this is being recorded. <laughs> no, I. Um, so luckily, all of the data that's taken with the Chandra X-ray telescope becomes public after a while. So there's actually a treasure trove of many, many Chandra observations that have been taken by other people for other reasons that you can access and analyze for your own science. And so actually most of my work uses archival data that's just you know, sitting on you know, the computer and is, is accessible to download. Um, so I don't actually have to luckily wait for, for new data to come in um, unless you know, for some reason I need a new observation of the source. Um, do black holes always exist in like galaxies or could there be some that have eaten all the material around them and they're just there by themselves? Yeah, so um, we think that there might be something called wandering black holes. Um, these are black holes that are like wandering in space. Perhaps they've been kicked out of their galaxy after a violent galaxy merger where there was enough energy to kind of kick it out. And it doesn't have material really around it to accrete. And so it's just kind of wandering. Um, we do believe that they exist. Um, they are very hard to find. Right, because we need to be able to see material that's around the supermassive black holes, um, you know, that it's accreting to see it. But we see evidence for, you know, we're starting to see possible scenarios where we see black holes that are offset from their center. So it's evidence that maybe they're moving outwards. And so this links to the idea of kind of a wandering supermassive black hole through, through space. Um, one last question from the in person audience. Okay. Are there any? Uh new emerging technologies within the astrophysics or astronomy community that really excite you that might uh, progress the field forward, other than James Webb, of course? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think this answer will be slightly biased, but I am I'm really excited about a higher resolution um, X-ray observatory, and that's technology that's um, connected to the mirrors of the X-ray telescope. And so if we can create mirrors um, that will allow us to resolve things on really, really tiny scales, for my science at least, I'll be able to find a lot of new pairs of, of supermassive black holes. Um, so if that mirror technology um, can, um, can, can happen soon, I think it'll be really revolutionary. Um, great, so two more questions from the online audience. And of course, uh, for all of you, Adi will be available after the talk if you wanna chat with her. Um, so slightly advanced questions and maybe a little bit hypothetical um, from AC. It is proposed that the Milky Way supermassive black hole um, spin axis is actually pointed at us and not aligned with the axis of the galaxy. So how could this occur? Yeah. So um, this is one of the results from the Event Horizon telescope observations. It looks like the um, supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way is actually like face on. So it's not rotating with the Milky Way, it's rotating perpendicular to it. Um, it's actually not that weird. If you remember what I said, the scale of the supermassive black hole is so small with respect to the scale of the galaxy. So the supermassive black hole doesn't necessarily need to be on the same axis as the galaxy. Um, the axis that it's on won't really affect what the galaxy is doing. We think that during maybe more violent times in a galaxy's evolution, like during galaxy mergers, or where supermassive black holes are merging, this can affect the tilt of that supermassive black hole and kind of knock it to a different angle. Wow, that is really cool. Um, okay, final question. Um, again, from uh, Mauro Cubido asking, could an environment around a supermassive black hole ever not produce a disk image? Um, and if so, what other shapes could the image have? Oh, so you're saying, are they asking you once you a halo? Um, I think, you know, produce a, a disk image, it refers to the ray. Um, around the, the, the event horizon telescope image? I think so. So um, when you get, so I hope I can answer this correctly. Dan, feel free to jump in. When you get to the scale that the event horizon is imaging, I believe you'll, you'll always see a halo. 
because you're really down to, to the radius at which light can no longer escape and anything around that is, is getting lensed from around and behind the supermassive black hole. And that will be regardless of the angle that you're viewing the supermassive black hole from, you'll always see a halo. Um, on slightly larger scales though, um, the emission can look very different. Um, do you have anything to add to that or? I think that's good. Okay. You're looking through the cloud of gas that's in front of the black hole. Right, and I mean, so, oh, my screen isn't sharing anymore. In that last video I showed you, you saw a halo and kind of also like a disc around the two black holes and maybe I can um, change this. Oh, I can't, okay. In any case, you'll likely always see a halo. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, so that's the end of the Q and A. Well, let's thank Adi again. So before we end this event, I would also like to just quickly show you a couple of uh, ways to follow Kaipak if you have been enjoying um, our event and uh, want to attend more. So um, let me try to share a screen here so you could also see directly um, on the screen. Um, so of course, we are on all the major um, social media channels, um, which include Facebook. So, um, I, we have a really long full name, but if you if you just search for uh, Kaplan Institute or KaiPak, uh, that is us. So you can see that we frequently post all the upcoming events. And even if you want to um, join us for um, other uh, small celebrations, um, we would also post other um, like uh, stargazing events like we did for the lunar eclipse viewing. Um, that is one way to follow us. Um, the other one would be um, on Twitter, so we have uh, Twitter with a handle Kaipak One. So without the one, that was not the official <laughs> channel. Um, and again, we would not only advertise our um, um, events, but also um, all kinds of updates, acknowledgements, news about Kaipak uh, that you could follow. So we also have an outreach page um, where you can basically just type in kaipak.stanford.edu. And under the outreach tab, you could see um, these are all of the programs that we're currently offering. So aside from the public lecture series, we also have K through 12 virtual sessions. We're also trying to do more regular in-person and also virtual stargazing. Um, and finally, we will be having um, open house or community day coming up soon um, that will be open to the public. So most likely be at the Slack National Observer uh, National Lab where we have another location. Um, so to end, um, we have actually scheduled our next public lecture and uh, that's going to be on another very interesting topic. Um, how do you actually simulate the entire universe on a computer? Well, I tried on my personal laptop and it broke. So that's, well, one of the solutions is actually simulating it on a supercomputer. And um, um, one of our other uh, postdoc fellow will actually be giving this talk and um, tell us all about how we actually compare um, the universe simulated on the computer um, and the actual universe that we observe and what can we infer from those. So um, yes, if you're interested, feel free to directly sign up. Again, all the public lecture series will be offered in a hybrid format. If you wanna come in again, you're well, more than welcome to, or if you just feel lazy and wanna say, okay, I'm watching it online, that's also good. And all the recordings will be available on YouTube as well. So. Well, thank you again for joining us. We really hope that you have a great time. Um, we will follow up with a, an email tomorrow actually asking for feedback um, and also what kind of topics that you want to hear from us in the future. So this is one of the examples where um, that this topic actually got a lot of upvotes and now you hear it. So um, yeah. We welcome all kinds of uh, suggestions and you are actually the one having to say with what we are offering in the future. So thank you again for joining us and uh, hope to see you again soon.